Hey, hello everyone. I'm here at Akira Retreat Center, um, which happens to be near my house and happens to be where my friends are after the Horizons Conference. And we are here with the leaders of the Global Psychedelic Society, GPS. And I would love it if you guys could introduce yourselves and just say a little bit. All right, take it from there. Um, I'm Marisa Sturtz. I am a filmmaker, storyteller, uh, been involved in community organizing since 2016, 17, uh, and um, one of the stewards, co stewards of the Global Psychedelic Society, focusing on community, or focusing on communication and strategy. All right. Uh, yeah, and I'm Mike Margulies. Uh, uh, also a co-steward of the GPS, um, been working in psychedelic education and community building since, you know, 2015, got my start in Baltimore, organizing local community and monthly events with speakers. And, um, that community eventually evolved into what's today, the Baltimore Psychedelic Society. And I've worked under various other projects and banners over the years um that brush uh psychedelic seminars that, that in turn grew and uh but in recent years my attention's been on this gps network which i've been working on for many years kind of quietly and then and as other folks got involved it really has ramped up in the last couple of years and it's been really cool great thanks yeah hi um i'm jazz um, <clears throat> Jazz Kadash, I am a cultural and medical anthropologist. Um, I've been getting involved in the psychedelic space since uh, 2016. And um, yeah, as an anthropologist, I kind of just take a look at all aspects of the ways in which North America is currently adopting psychedelics into our modern day culture, medicine, and policy. So uh, I've worked in community organizing, and, and I have also worked in uh, writing ballot initiatives. I've worked in tech software for psychedelics, and I've also worked in developing protocols for psychedelic therapists. I train um, psychedelic facilitators, uh, but truly the heart of my work lies in the work that I get to do with the Global Psychedelic Society. It just brings me so much joy to be able to do that work. Um, and yeah, it's, it's an honor, you know? Thank you. So who wants to introduce the Global Psychedelic Society and tell the listeners what it is, what the intention of it is, what it's about, and, and you know, where is it going? What's the mission? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> so uh, for any listeners out there who are not so familiar, um, psychedelic societies are community-led organizations dedicated to educating, harm reduction, and, and community building around psychedelics. Uh, they've popped up on their own uh, all around the world since 2010, and uh, there's over 300 now around the world. And up until, I think, 2016, nobody, <clears throat> they weren't necessarily as connected to each other, um, but slowly with Beyond Psychedelics. And it was the Beyond Psychedelics conference in Prague in 2016. Where there was the first gathering of leaders, and then 2018, a boom fest. We got together, brought a bunch of leaders together. COVID hit, jazz came on board, started leading um, bi-monthly meetings of these leaders, um, and and it really started to pick up speed, especially with uh, Denver's Psych Sci 23, when we brought 70 leaders together to share resources on um, what does it mean to to have a thriving psychedelic society? How what are the different models and things that different leaders have uh, figured out, and how do we share them with each other instead of reinventing the wheel? And so it really began as a network of leaders, but it has since also expanded into um, sort of the mycelial connective tissue. And we see there being a real need to help newcomers on their psychedelic journey 
discover the first touch point to psychedelics through community, through these psychedelic societies. There's a lot of resources that are being developed in the greater community uh, in the psychedelic space. Um, and, and the psychedelic societies are an amazing way to get that out to the people on the streets and, and help connect all the dots in the space. Anything I think guys want to add? Yeah, I think I would add, you know, seeing how the movement is accelerating and moving in all these really brilliant and beautiful directions, uh, having community as the cornerstone or the bedrock of this movement is increasingly becoming more and more important in order to ensure a sustainable future. You know, we can change medical uh, research, we could change policy, but really at the root of all of our human uh, interaction uh, and the systems that we're part of and building is uh, the culture and community that we're, that we're building. So with the psychedelic societies, what we get to do is really disseminate um, the educational pieces around harm reduction, education, and how to safely use uh, psychedelics and, and various substances amidst the paradigm shift of medicine changing and policy changing. So it's really that. I see it as this third prong um, to really shifting a paradigm. Nice. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I think Aris and Jazz have done a good job of sharing the important pieces. And, and we have, there's a lot of different ways that this vision, this mission, like manifests. Um, and so we bring the leaders of these groups together. Um, there's bi-weekly meetings uh, that happen on Zoom and then also in-person ones like they'll be, you know, Marisa mentioned that it's like about science, but also at Horizons. Um, and we have this big public facing um, kind of after party decompression uh, the Sunday after Horizons, but also before things open to the public, we had a moment where it was just for the Psychedelic Society leaders. And so things like that are, these are really important, I think, to what we're doing is providing these opportunities for these leaders who otherwise would be operating separately to like not have to reinvent wheels and sharing information and resources. And then, and increasingly also um, generating resources for them, like this uh, starter care resource kit that Jazz has been working on. And um, we have a, you know, a free resource out there. It's a work in progress still, ever looking to complete. Um, and other projects too in the works. Like we want to create this mentorship program for new groups that want to start. Um, and so, there, and there's a whole number of other things that could establish. We have a tour circuit also. Um, currently, like Comedian Shane Moss is um, on tour, and at each of the stops, we connect them to the local community. And so they tell their people, like, hey, this like you know, comedians in town, but also people coming for Shane can find the local community. So, creating those kinds of connections. Um, so there's just some examples of some of the pro some of the many projects that we're doing uh, through the GPS. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So um, I'm curious for for someone who hasn't been to a psychedelic society meeting or or meet up whether that's online or in person in a local committee, what would you say happens generally? And I'm sure they're all very different. But what is you know the general intention of what goes on in a typical psycho society like Mia? Is it to, because this has actually happened in numerous times where I live um, or other <clears throat> meetings where it's a place people want to go and just find drugs. Oh, God. Usually, yeah. <laughs> Usually that's something that, and they, so, you know, when I was organizing local community and other ones, usually we want people not to be doing that. Um, there's usually explicit this time we're saying, hey, this isn't the place to look for drugs. Um, but it is a place to buy. And it is a place to buy community. And so the types of events can vary. So sometimes there might be speakers. Um, there are psychedelic research centers all around. Uh, so when I was organizing in Baltimore, you know, I would have some of the Hopkins researchers give talks. And, mm -hmm. and similarly in San Diego, where I live now, the AWARE Project will have people from UCSD giving talks. Um, so that might be one example. Or... Another example would be integration circles are people who want to process their experiences they've had with psychedelics, uh, and maybe their close peers aren't people that will that with that can come by to 
crowdplace their experiences with. And sometimes just social gatherings, you know, bonfires or um, kava nights or something like that, just opportunities to meet people. Um, and actually the best way to understand if you've never been to a psychedelic society meeting is to find your local psychedelic society. Um, much of the other thing that we uh, they do with the GPS is we've been maintaining this resource, this map on our website. Where So wherever you are in the world, uh, we provide this easy resource to find your local community. And that's at globalpsychedelic.org. We can just click and find the map. It's funny because over the years, I've had so many people, just strangers out there on the internet, contact me and say, no one where I live dealt with psychedelic. Mm-hmm. And even even still to this day, I, mean, I get that. And I usually tell them to like go, go, you know, to their search engine and look for a local psychedelic society or even like somewhere a few hours away. Um, but let me ask, because this has been a suggestion I've actually given my clients over the years and especially in the last, you know, year knowing about what you guys are doing. If someone lives in a community, um, for example, where I'm sitting right now, it's like there's not a huge community around here. I mean, there is and there's not. How easy is it for someone to start their own psychedelic society? And then what do you say about there's still fear, you know, like the judgment, I don't want my neighbors knowing. Does this come up for people still? Well, one, there is a Hudson Valley psychedelic Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that. that was like the other side of Hudson Valley. <laughs> I know. No, I'll say um, <laughs> one of the beautiful things about the GPS network is that uh, all the society leaders get to learn from each other. And so many of them are at different stages of developing their psychedelic societies. So, for example, like the UK Psychedelic Society is one of the longest running ones. And they've had some of their systems put in place for longer than the GPS network has even existed. And so even we are learning things from them. And so... Um, and then some organizations are cert- are certified 501c3 nonprofits, right? And a lot of the ones that are coming in, especially in this past year, are brand new. And they're like, I don't really know how to get started, right? And so the first most important thing that we offer is a space for these uh, like-minded leaders to come together and learn from one another and exchange resources, uh, the second level of that, which we started noticing there's some recurring themes and issues that people run into. So we started to create a resource kit, which Mike alluded to earlier, of kind of the bare bones of how do you start your own community-based organization that is rooted in psychedelics. And it kind of goes over what roles do you need to consider? Uh, what are the pros and cons of being a nonprofit? How do you open a bank account? Like maybe don't put psychedelic in your name sure. when you're opening a bank account and all these kinds of things like that. Um, what kinds of events to host? What frequency um, should you be hosting events and things like that? So we're actually currently fundraising to really develop this resource kit. Um, and right now we have the bare bones up online, but it's really just just the early stage. And so many people have shared uh, how much that has been supportive to them already. One of the big things for sure is this piece of stigma, uh, our piece on stigma. And I think, you know, what we've learned from our leaders in places like Thailand and Ukraine, you know, it, it's funny, like when we say global, like people don't really like think global, like we're so stuck in the U.S. so frequently. And um, is they, they're often saying, you know, we get to learn from you guys in the U.S., And But it wasn't that long ago where we were leading our own societies and there was stigma. But because we kind of just kept pushing, stigma started slowly to shift, right? And the person who started uh, psychedelic societies back in 2010, his name was Daniel Jabor, and uh, we lost him uh, years ago. Uh, He said, come out of the psychedelic closet, right? And so it's that invitation and... Uh, when you start hosting these kinds of events and showing, like, look at the value of psychedelics, you're really coming out of this closet uh, of educating people on what these can be instead of just the, the typical ster- or stereotypical ideas that people have of them. Yeah, I want to piggyback off that. I think that's a lot of the point. Is, and I, Daniel Jabor's uh, words around coming out of the psychedelic closet were very influential on me. I, I think I must have listened to that. It's a recording of a talk he gave at Burning Man um, before he passed. And 
It's on the Psychedelic Salon podcast, and I was, must have been listening to it um, when I was in like Southeast Asia um, on a sabbatical. Um, and you know, by the time I came back home and decided to start organizing this in this field, um, that was a big part of the reason, you know. So, so your point, like, yeah, some people might be uncomfortable, and not everyone can come out of the psychedelic closet, and that's okay. But some of us can do it, and those of us who can and who feel safe. Um, the more of us that do it, the easier it becomes for other people to do it. And that was certainly what I started. Um, you know, when I started psychedelic seminars in Baltimore nine years ago, um, it was very explicitly like, okay, I want to, it's like a be the change you want to see in the world. I want to live in a world where we can be open and honest about psychedelics. Um, and so I need to start being open and honest about psychedelics. And so I, and it, it was Baltimore 2015 it was a lot even riskier than today you know I and people thought I was crazy They're like going what do you mean you're making public events about psychedelic drugs um but um it was important to me and 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 now I look around like wow okay well it seems to be working because now there's so many groups like this and there is a conversation happening um so I think yeah breaking that exact uh, taboo is kind of the point. And fascinating. And you mentioned Ukraine and Thailand, and I know there's one in India. Where else are there any surprising places? Yeah, not like yeah. popping up in North Korea yet. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the India one isn't. Uh, as far as I know, there isn't an active society in India. Currently, there was one, but the person who's running that thing should kind of pivot it to like something slightly different than. You know, when we think about psychedelic societies, is it that particular kind of organization that's holding regularly occurring yeah. monthly events? She's still involved in like psychedelic space, but in a kind of a different way. Yeah. But there's, um, yeah, there, Taiwan was someone I was talking to, talk, reading from Taiwan the other day, they're just starting. Um, I don't even think they've made a, like a public facing entity yet, but um, I was just speaking with this person. And there's, and there's, Definitely political sensitivity yeah. in some places. We're also sorry to connect with uh, organizations in Russia. Um, right now, they're not on our map, but in building relationships with people there. We also have the Arab Psychedelic Society, uh, which has really been popping up. We have the Farsi Psychedelic Society, uh, which is led by Parham, who is also on the TPS team. And, you know, when he comes from Iran, and it's, and luckily, you know, he lives in the Bay Area right now, but. In places like Iran, you can't really have these kinds of conversations there. So it's really quite yeah. mumbling for us yeah. to have these leaders from all around. And of course, like all around Europe, we have we have a ton in, in Northern Europe, like France and Berlin and Germany, um, Switzerland, and I um, mean, but yeah. also in South America, Ecuador, Mexico, Estonia, yeah. Peru. And then, like, yeah, and then another interesting case, too, is, like, the Singapore Psychedelic Society. Can I ask about Singapore? Yeah, there's a Singapore Psychedelic Society, but in Singapore, uh, as I was understanding it, um, you know, it's not even legal if you're a citizen of Singapore to do psychedelics in another country where it's legal. So you can be prosecuted if you come back to Singapore, right? And so what they're working on at the, in the Singapore Psychedelic Society is just basics, like, changing the laws so that you can at least do psychedelics safely in place in other places that are not Singapore where it is legal, right? So people are starting from way different points, but to your point earlier, like people can learn from um, existing groups and that's part of what we're doing is um, trying to provide that. I want to ask, um, so it's three of you as the leadership team. I know there's been others involved. So this is, is this officially a nonprofit organization? Is this a 501c3? Is this something you want to monetize? Like, what do you, I mean, of course, you're, it's a passion project. You want to help people. I think it really is important, this work. But then we all know, got to pay the bills, got to survive. So, yeah, what is the model right now? And how is this um, running? Uh, currently, so we're an LLC with a fiscal, a 501c3 fiscal sponsor. So, uh, that means it's in the sense we're kind of um, a hybrid organization. So uh, we can accept tax deductible donations through our fiscal sponsor, the Limina Foundation. Um, so we can operate as a nonprofit in that way un under that fiscal sponsorship. But we also um, we're operating 
uh, during LLC. So um, we also have the ability to do things that are not strictly under that context too. Um, and we're figuring out our model. You know, we, we're trying all the routes. We haven't figured out how to make a living doing this yet. Um, so this has been volunteer yeah, led yeah. Um, so far. Yeah, we have received sponsors. You know, this last event we did though, we received we did receive sponsorships from Dr. Bronner's and Maps and others, and um, you know, Limina Foundation themselves and Oren Fund, and we had ticket sales. And so there's, uh, you know, so we have revenue coming in, although most of that got spent on things like the venue. And after the, after all the expenses of an event, um, you know, really. Uh, you're not like breaking in the dough exactly when it's all said and done. Um, but we are pursuing different routes. So uh, we are pursuing the philanthropic route because we have a statistical sponsor. So if there, um, if there are philanthropists out there that like what we're yes. talking about and want to try to bring it up, then yeah, now. we are, we'll love to talk to you. Um, and we can accept tax deductible donations. Uh, we're also long term though, we don't necessarily want to be reliant on philanthropy so we're also want to develop our own business models of sustainability um and we're figuring out what that looks like but there's a tension there between sustainability and access so we thought about like for example like it doesn't cost anything for a psychedelic society to be part of the gps network mm-hmm. we have thought about the idea of like a membership but then i wouldn't want to turn anyone away for the lack of funds a lot of these leaders are the volunteers themselves but there could be a middle way Right, where there's a price, but like we don't, but this is what we did for our vet, for example. This week, this weekend, there was a price and there were different tiers to put shoes into at sliding scale. And on top of that, there was no one turned away. So, literally, I mean, I had an email address, you know, scholarships at globalpsychedelic.org. Every single person who emailed us saying, Hey, I can't afford the ticket, we said, Cool, we're going to give you what, what can you pay? You know, we let everyone pay whatever they wanted to ultimately. Yeah. So, there's, we're experimenting with those kind of economic models too. Yeah, and I, I would say uh, it's really important to us uh, to move small. Uh, I've seen just so many organizations in the psychedelic space moving quite fast and, you know, developing their models and then it just kind of disappears. And if we, we really want this organization to outlive us, you know, we want one of the core tenants is... Um, is uh, and regenerative, regenerative steroid. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll just repeat that piece. Uh, <laughs> one of our core tenets is regenerative stewardship, and the idea is that it lasts for generations. And for that purpose, we are moving very slow, and we really take our roles as stewards as something really um, powerful uh, and important. And it's not just like, oh, we're co-founders, right? So therefore we should be making money. It's more like, okay, well, we're steward in this organization to li- to live uh, sustainably. And so with that, uh, that's why just kind of operating as this like LLC right now is what like step one looks like in order for us to really develop our like um, our bylaws, right? And so in the meantime, what we've been doing is really setting up our a very decentralized form of uh, structuring our organization, which allows for a decentralized decision-making power to occur. And if we were to just like become a 501c3, then we would have to be jumping through so many other bureaucratic hoops that would not really necessarily be so conducive to being a decentralized organization. So we've moved really slow right. with that piece. One other component and then I'll hand and it to you to you after this yeah it is um by being an LLC we get to have revenue streams and so currently with our tour circuit project that Risa is leading with our uh, with Lyndon who's on our team uh we we allow for space for an actual revenue model so that we're not completely reliant on so not to best as well I mean, in, okay. um well and to add to that Rebecca can whip hand it to you too um yeah, like we, but being a 501, the, re- the reason we haven't made a 501c3 is several. Um, and yeah, it, it restricts in ways like what sort of things you can do, but also to, to add to what you're saying about the governance, you know, if you're a 501c3, you are a corporation and you have a mandated type of structure. You must have a board, you must have, there's like certain roles you must have. 
uh, and it's mandated. And part of what we are doing is actually creating different types of governance structures. And there's ways there's ways you can with a valid one c three still do it. Like if you make a five hundred one c three, and then the board votes essentially votes away its own power into a different structure. There's kind of ways you can finagle it. Um, but we're trying to, um, yeah, you, it, it's more difficult in a lot of ways. Um, and part of what we are innovating on is the governance structure itself uh, of how we're running a more decentralized, non-corporate kind of organization. Right? Yeah. There's a couple of places that to take that. I mean, <laughs> which one do I take? Um, I mean, the regenerative stewardship like, um, and, and the, the model of governance that we're talking about is called TEAL, mm -hmm. uh, which is Ken Wilber uh, philosophy of organization where, and as I said, it's shared. Um, building on Ken Wilber. Bet building on his work. Who wrote the book, Reorganize? Uh, Frederic yeah. Lelou wrote the book, Reinventing Organizations, yeah. and it draws up both um, Ken Wilber's work. Ken Wilber wrote the foreword to it, but um, it's drawn from a number of people, including Ken Wilber, but Frederic Lelou. And Ken Wilber came up with a system to, to to organize different power structures, and he does it by color. And teal is the one we're currently at. Um, it's this evolution of instead of top-down and hierarchical power structures, CEO, regular C-suite running the show, instead we have decided and divided decision-making powers by circles of of spheres of like, okay, so I run the um, I'm 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 the technical lead of the tour circuit um so i am the decision maker and i work with the team and linda is actually also running a lot of it with me um but when you are the decision maker you don't have to um you you will you can get advice from people below you like people that will be affected by your decision not below you because there's no real up and buck but people who will be affected and then people who might be a little more experienced in that in that realm and then that gets incorporated and we have one big circle of all the decision makers and then together we share what's going on so that we can operate as a, a, a an organism that is you know like informing each other and it's like a school of fish or a flock of birds no no bird is saying hey guys let's go left here we are sensing what's alive and you know as an idea comes up we share it and we all we go over it but it's not as it's not consensus it is it is much more like we are each empowered to make a decision in our sphere of um, excellence or our uh, expertise and it makes for a really much more like a live way of making decisions where people are empowered to be their whole self and operate in in what brings them joy as opposed to um more t typical structures yeah i want to piece that anya uh, who ran the UK psychedelic study, I think for around 10 through Teal, uh, shared with us is if you have to vote, then you fail. Um, because uh, if you're voting, it means you're not actually value aligned. And you need to, and, and the whole goal is to make sure that everybody on the team is value aligned. And I should be able to, if I have an idea that I know is aligned with the, with the organization mission and value, then everybody should be able to see the, the value of that idea. And so if there's like, oh, there's a divide in what we should do, then then we have lost like the, that core kind of piece that brings us all together on a uh, shared mission. Yeah, I've got the seg <laughs> not on, on Teal um, and um, have done almost entire podcasts on this before. Um, but... Um, like she did one recently on Psychonauts today, so if you want to go even deeper, but I guess I would also just add in brief around the, how the decisions are made. Um, yeah, so it's not hierarchical, right? Things, decisions don't get kicked up a chain, but yeah, not democratic either. Um, usually, essentially everyone in the organization makes decisions. And um, and yes, during this advice process, I'm very so was speaking up, you get advice from other people in the organization, but the, generally it's like the person who's closest to the decision, whoever's closest to the project is making, as opposed to like in traditional organizations, you can kick up a chain to the managers, but it doesn't, decisions don't go up a hierarchical chain in this way. Um, they stay closest to the ground level of where, of the person making the decision. Um, and things that resembled um, where their managers and other structures become more like in the structure, a coach, for example. Mm -hmm. What makes it so exciting is like, 
this work we're doing on being sort of the connective mycelial tissue between so many different parts of the psychedelic ecosystem. Um, what makes this so exciting is that it's probably the only way we could ever do something so ambitious because being the connective mycelial tissue that takes the resources that are being developed by Zenno, by Dance Safe, by um, education, and just like all these different orgs that are providing awesome stuff and getting them down out to the people. Uh, like no, no C-suite should be deciding how that's done. That should be just done collectively in a community or um, ran organization. This is amazing. And I'm curious, how has it been received by, I, I assume, then partner with these other organizations, like the whole psychedelic ecosystem? The, have you been, has it been received well so far by everybody? Or are there some players that are like, nah, I don't want to help out. I don't want to get involved because I'm busy doing my own thing. I mean, I'm curious. Like, And that's where the value aligned conversation, I guess, comes in. But, but yeah. it's not about external kind of organization is yeah. adopting our model um it's more just the way that we make decisions internally mm -hmm. and and so far yeah you know like the collaborations between other organizations that kind of happens like there's usually like one main point person that's kind of like leading that but um it's not that the other organizations need to adopt that yeah but so far they've but been it's pretty not. favorable you know it, it, yeah it feels very encouraging and i think a lot of the, you know just like us it's a bootstrap um space right now and then like so these things need to move with the speed of trust as so many people in our space say so it's just taking time and we have really only you know we're still in that process of kind of putting on our own oxygen mask and um we're developing these things and as they become ripe i think there's a place to be like oh you have awesome harm reduction materials. How can we help get them to a place where we can share them with our society leaders? You know, these are things that like would be fun, would be great and in service, I think. Um, and and then this just built with the relationship and this time unfolds. Amazing. Anybody um, want to add before I ask the next question? No, that okay. Um, so what I'm wondering is if someone wants to start one up a, a psychedelic society um but you know they're putting on their own oxygen mask themselves like it's it's a labor of love um but what do you what do you say to them that uh, about maybe the time and energy and even resources that go into it so for example where i live the psychedelic society meets at people's homes um but what is someone lives somewhere where it's like they don't have that or they don't have a place to meet or um, you know, they don't even know how to start getting the word out. You know, do you help them with even like these little startup pieces of like how to make it happen? And also with, let's say no resources, like completely free, you know, other than their time and energy. Is this? Yeah. I mean, we have the resource kit, yeah. which, you know, is still a work in progress. And, um, we have a mentorship program, uh, or well, an idea of develop that we haven't developed yet, but. Yeah. Um, that is one of the projects that is high on on the list to really get going. Is it's more of a hands on that would supplement the resource kit that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I'm showing you know, and it would. There's a few different forms of it we played with, like you pairing people up with societies that exist, bringing on cohorts of new societies together so they can also learn from each other. Um, and yeah, this is this one. It should be coming. Uh, Aver at least they first pass at it. it should be coming pretty soon I hope um, oh. and um well yeah and that's that's the idea of the resource kit and this upcoming mentorship program I'll add you know once they have a website or what do, what is the minimum they need to be listed on our yeah does this I mean lighting? we basically uh yeah when new societies are starting uh, we basically want them to ha actually have started organized events and usually it means like some of them there's a few that aren't public facing the majority of them do have some sort of either website or or at least like an instagram or meetup or facebook page or some presence where people can find their events um there's a couple exceptions where people are are more of like an under the radar network but um once someone has actually started organizing the events then we bring them onto the network uh and they can join our calls and they can be on the map um, we usually don't bring people on though. They're saying that are 
um, saying like, oh, I want to start. Yeah. So I have people that say like, they want, they want you to actually like make that first step of like actually bringing something concrete in. And as soon as people that are saying, I want to start, I need, I need help with that first step too. Well, how they kept that piece in place too. Which is what those donations will go to. And that's right. About yeah. our, one of our first points we really want to develop, but it, what happens is if you get people too new and to our like meetings, then it's, it makes it really hard right. to yeah. the more experienced society. So, but yeah. it is a high point that we really want to prioritize. Yeah. That would be a new program I to develop. That. Um, yeah. So put it in basic effort. It's yeah. not, it can't be too hard, but you just, yeah, you have a thing on meetup. Yeah. And start meeting yeah. up. And if you build it, say, like, um, they, yeah. yeah. One thing that's also really valuable to name here is like, I don't know what the assembled psychedelic society might need. <laughs> you know, I grew up in Canada and Montreal, and um, I can get an idea of what societies in North America might need. But it, it can't, it's not on us to, like, how do we know what person would be really good to lead the, the society in, you know, Turkey or in Greece, right? And so that's why they, it's really important for them to take that first step because it's so important to have a group of people that you can rely on in terms of a group of leaders to push the thing and make it go. But I don't know those people, right? And so... Um, there's a really delicate balance between giving guidance and resources on here's how you could start an organization and then also providing space for local leaders to know what's best for their community. And, um, yeah, and societies, societies, the individual ones, they aren't chapters of the GPS. Yeah. Every psychedelic society is its own independent entity, and GPS is this network connecting for sharing but you know as jazz is saying like every person knows what's best for their place so we could tell you like and we can show you well this is what people can say this is working for me here and many societies are doing different things some are doing 501c3 some are doing llc some are uh doing uh, you know one type of that some are doing another some have different legal status of psychedelics or cultural status in other places and so everyone in their locality has to fit to purpose for their local their local community their local needs so we do prefer that our societies are not actively providing medicine ceremonies. No. Um, it does add an extra layer of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, liability for us to be placing them on our map. And so there are a lot of organizations and societies out there that do offer ceremony. And it's best when they do that under a different organization name, just so that we can, like, because to monitor 300 organizations making and ensuring that they are providing ethical services and, um, you know, engaging in indigenous, like, uh, benefit honoring and sharing and oh, there's so many components there that we just said, okay, we're going to put that one on the side for now. But very soon, we're going to start being in a world where most societies are actually indeed offering a ceremony you know the lines are getting blurred i mean some of your retreats uh, there's some places where there's decrim happening and so that's changing it and there's and there's some like developing community healing frameworks in legal context too so it, the lines are getting blurred but yeah generally what we're looking at though for when we're saying like what's a psychedelic society it's not so you know we're not talking about people that are focused on holding medicine circles it's people that are focused on educational community events um not not really focused on like giving medicine itself so you're gonna get along into my cell phone ring how many people go and like lure people at these events i mean i i'm sure it goes on everywhere. yeah there's i think there are some out there or some people that i think a lot of societies out there have these like caveats at all their events saying like this is not a place to source or distribute medicine. Right. Um, because of that like poaching kind of energy. And and actually like I've seen uh people who are leading integration circles, for example, like uh if there's a certain incident with uh one of the people in the circles and then uh it seems like that person needs extra attention. The person leading like the integration circle might say Hey, you know what? This sounds like something you should like come to me for my personal services for, right? And it's like, 
if there's all, there's so much monitoring that, that needs to be done in those areas that like that's, that's a direct conflict of interest yeah. right these are peer support yeah. groups and you're sourcing clients from those groups right and so that's why the resource kit is really valuable because if i just started my society this year and i'm fresh to the psychedelic scene and i'm super green and excited i would have no idea that somebody would do such a thing especially like with our excitement with what psychedelics are doing for the individual like i think so many people will believe in the best and others and to be able to say like this is something we've come across like Make sure as you bring on integration circle facilitators, like to make to, to develop your like clearly set rules. And maybe your society is okay with that. Yeah. That's okay. If you're fine with that, that's not for us to tell you. But we'll just give you that kind of like heads up of like make sure you have that conversation with your team before you kind of start offering integration circles. I can impress I'm telling you with my jaw drop. <laughs> I'm going to tell my clients never to do that because I I would never think that anybody would do that. But then now that you named it, I'm like, I'm sure those on all the time. If there's one message you want to get out to people uh, about psychedelic societies, about the GPS, about like what's, you know, the vision for the future of the world that you want to see, like what is the message that you want people to hear? I'll take a stab. <laughs> um, I, I really... I've been running around at all the conferences, going to all our friends and all these different organizations and being like, can I share with you what we're doing so you can hold this vision with us? Mm-hmm. Like we, what is, what does the psychedelic future look like? It looks like one where we're all connected to each other, where we all are sharing resources in an efficient way, where no person is falling into the, between the cracks because they didn't know they didn't have access. There was no accountability. And so, you know, in my mind's eye, I'm like, I hold the vision of a brick and mortar in every city where a person who's new to psychedelics easily can find it. And they come in and there's an office person, like a psychedelic uh, secretary who's like, what are you here for? What are you, what's your interest? And they can go into psychedelics and addiction, psychedelics and expansion and creativity, uh, peer support, you know, like they can find all these different little like offices are on the side of this brick and mortar. So whatever their need is, they can get connected to the best in the space and have access to that so that they're really supported on their journey. That's my my little piece right there. Yeah, you know what? I really love referring to this Buckminster Fuller quote that you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, you have to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Um, and so it... The thing we want to change is, you know, a drug war or prohibition. Um, we want to make a post-prohibition world, right? So, um, so we have to make what is the model that makes that obsolete, right? And I think it's absolutely education and community. The post-prohibition world has to be rooted in education and community, and all these things. And psychedelics are now entering the mainstream, but in a lot of ways, the way that psychedelics are coming through has missed something really, really critical here. Um, yeah, you know, we're talking about medical use of psychedelics, and we're talking about psychedelics for DSD, for depression, um, for addiction. Um, but it, we're still looking at the problem as though it's like people live in a vacuum, right? Like, oh, these people that have PTSD or addiction or depression, we're going to treat them with the psychedelic. Um, but why are there so many people with trauma and depression and addiction? Right? Like there's underlying systemic issues that require community healing at the root. It's our disconnection, our isolation. We need to reconnect with each other. We, we need to get out of this separation. And, and so community healing is essential. Um, so in order to build the more beautiful world, our hearts know is possible as Charles Eisenstein phrases it, um, we need that reconnection. We need that community healing. Um, and so consider anyone who's interested in psychedelics and psych- this, this, as we use the so-called psychedelic renaissance and all of this, um, consider that it's not just really about these substances getting out of these substances being medicalized, but more deeply, it's about systemic change and community healing. It's really beautiful, but beautifully cut. And um, that just, there's a reason we all work together and it's, because we're really alive 
um, those exact things. That one. And mission. <laughs> I'm sorry, that box. So where can people find you, follow you, download things? Do you have an email list, by the way? Do you have an email list? Yeah. Good. Sign up. Uh, we have a newsletter that comes out every month or two. Um, any more. We're trying not to put too many things out there, but we're finding a lot of people want to know what's going on. Um, we also have a place where you can join our community. If you're looking to start your own psychedelic society, you can go to globalpsychedelic.org and you can click on create a society or join our network. Um, and then find one. Or find one and they or volunteer with us. We do that. And if you want to join, then we'll add you to our uh, to our Google group and our bi-monthly calls and our signal group where you can connect with other leaders, but you have to be offering some kind of consistent level of community. Um, and then you can find us on Instagram at Global Psychedelic Society. Um, and then for my own self, it would be underscore uh, J-A-Z dot I-E uh, for Instagram and I have a website, Jazz Kadash and Gmail and uh, jazzkadash.com. Uh, yeah, and my, I guess, my personal uh, website's mikemarbelese.net. My last name is M-A-R-G-O-L-I-E-S. I am at Jester of Amazon on Instagram. Yeah. And if you are the person out there who is has the money and wants to give it to us <laughs> to do all these wonderful things, um, get us that sustainability piece taken care of so we can not focus on that anymore and focus on all these projects. Uh, to support the societies on the road, email me, mm -hmm. uh, mike at globalpsychedelic.org. And you can find me at marisa sturtz at gmail.com. My website is your story is everything.com. And um, did we say the Global Psychedelic Society Instagram? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And we'll have all of this in the yeah. show notes and your links and your personal link. Mm -hmm. And yeah, did it get better for donations? Oh, yeah, yeah that's true. Online. That's true. And even if you have small amounts of debt, if you're not like the major philanthropist, if you any amount actually would be helpful for us. Yeah, we have a give butter. You can go to gps.fund and that leads you to our give butter and you can make a donation of any amount. Uh, actually, one thing we'd love to get more of now would be uh, monthly recurring donations. So you can make a donation of like 10 bucks a month. We like to, if we get enough people giving 10 bucks a month, that really adds up fast. Um, so that would be a great way to support too. Last way to support is, yeah, if you want to be a part of this, we really need you. Uh, it takes, takes not more, it takes the world, not just a village to make this a reality. And so this is an invitation. If you feel excited about the work you hear us talking about, there's a million different jobs and we'd be excited to plug you in. Awesome. Same thing. How are you? Thank you. Do we? Thank you. I see the vision. <laughs> yeah.